this mark of the beast? How does it fit in into the narrative? Well, the Bible tells us in, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18, about this mark of the beast. It's the only time that the Bible really refers to it. And the word mark there in, in, the, in the Greek language means it like a tattoo, really, or an, or an etching or something that's scratched into something. So it says it's going to be upon the right hand or the forehead. And it says you can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. Now, people wonder all about this as some kind of chip that's under the computer skin chip. or computer chip or barcode. There's been all, all kinds of speculation. In fact, uh, we were talking earlier about a friend of ours, Dr. Harold Wilmington. Yeah. He used to always say there's been a lot of sick, sick, sick about 666. <laughs> and I always like that because the mark of the beast is 666 there in, in the book of Revelation. And what I think this is, is it, it says there that it's the number of a man's name. Now, some have taken 666 to be one short of 777. Seven. In other words, God is perfection with seven, and this shows that this Antichrist who says he's God is actually 666. But I think it's actually going to be the numerical value of his name. In other words, you can, like in the, the Greek and Hebrew language, you can take the letters of the alphabet. They have numerical value. And so you can take a person's name and actually add that up, and you come up with a number. So I think his number will, his name will actually equal 666. That's how he'll be identified. So when people take that mark on their right hand or forehead, they'll actually be taking his name upon them, which pictures the idea of ownership. Is this during the time of Antichrist, when Antichrist is yes. at, its, at his prominent place uh, in the world of leadership, and, and basically the execution of how economy is done will be through this mark? That's right. It's going to be that last three and a half years, I take it, of this coming time of seven years of tribulation on the earth when he's going to rule the world. So not only will there be a one world government, but there will be a one world economy. And we can see how that can happen today very, very easily. What is the mark of the beast? According to Revelation 13, the Antichrist right hand man, the beast from the earth, also known as the false prophet, will implement a mark to strengthen his one word rule. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Revelation 13, verse 16 through 17. Seventy years ago, this would have been impossible, but with the progress of technology, this is a possibility. It is incredible that this prophecy was written years ago, before this was even a possibility. The word for the mark in the passage is haragma, which is a Greek word. The word was always associated with the Roman emperor in antiquity. It frequently included the emperor's name, image, and reign year. It was required for buying and selling, and it had to be affixed to documents to attest their authenticity. Every living person will be required to bear the beast's mark during the tribulation. It will be the only way to function in society, just as it was in ancient Rome. Why 666? Many people have speculated on the significance of the number 666. Goliath was six cubits tall and wore six pieces of armor. The statue of Nebuchadnezzar was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide, with six musical instruments beckoning its worshipers. Some have suggested that the beast represented by the number is Nero and other world leaders. All of these conjectures are just that, conjectures that tell us nothing about the number's meaning. The most likely answer is also the least interesting. It is the number of man, according to Revelation 13, verse 18. This is confirmed throughout the Bible. Man was created on the sixth day of creation, according to Genesis. Men were required to work six out of every seven days under the Old Testament law. A Hebrew could be held as a slave for no more than six years. After six years of sowing, a field was required to lie fallow. The number does not so much identify an individual as it does the human race. To summarize, the number 666 represents the pinnacle of human ingenuity and competence. The Antichrist is the pinnacle of man's final attempt to rule the world before Jesus finally triumphs over all those who oppose him. How will 666 miss the mark? During the tribulation, the mark of the beast will provide hollow promises and insufficient relief. It will allow people to buy and sell goods, but many will be unable to afford food. Revelation 6 verse 6 And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, 
a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Worse, the mark will separate its bearers from God's love and condemn them to eternal punishment. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of God's wrath, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Humanism is a philosophical stance which affirms the fact that humans have dignity and worth, and that they are capable of discovering truths about the world and humanity's place within it purely by appealing to reason and scientific method. In humanism, there is also the emphasis on faith in humanity. And a concern for building a more humane and just society. The humanists are usually non-religious people who believe that the universe is just a natural phenomenon with no supernatural aspect. Hence, the humanists view the world from the vantage point of reason and scientific method. This naturalistic and scientific view of the world has deep implications in how the humanists view the human person. On the one hand, the humanists see the human person as not distinct from the rest of nature. For the humanists, the human person is nothing but a purely worldly creature. Whose existence is a product of purposeless natural processes over a long period of change and development. For this reason, the humanists have a perfect feeling of being at home in the world. As Andrew Copson writes, the universe, thus discerned by our senses, appears a natural phenomenon. Behaving according to the principles that can be observed, determined, predicted, and described. This is the universe inhabited by the humanists. On the other hand, because the human person is not distinct from the rest of nature, and that her existence is a product of a purposeless natural processes. The humanists reject the idea of a meaningful life. For the humanists, therefore, the idea of a meaningful life as part of a divine plan is inconceivable. The only purpose or meaning in life is the one created by humans themselves. This explains why in humanism. People make their own purpose in life, set their own goals, and give meaning to their own life. The issue with humanism is that it tries to knock God off the throne, and it's and when we look at the Bible, the Bible talks about Lucifer, whose name is the devil,、um, and his attempt was to ascend to the Most High, and sit on the on both sides of the north. And basically replace God. And, this is and it's the same spirit, the same subverts mindset. Subverts God, right? Exactly. In Scotland, it has in, it, it has、uh, bolstered、yeah. the institution of marriage. You've had, you, you probably won't like this, but there've been pagan weddings. I know, of course, you won't like it.、Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just been, what the there've、Bible、been white the eagle lodge weddings, which is a new age philosophy. There've been spiritualist weddings, people who talk to the other side and and my back. So, see, I don't think this is good for society because God instituted marriage. God, based on the word of God, based on the word of God, He brought Adam and Eve together. 
Mm. And so the very historical book which has stood the test of time is mm. the very guideline we ought to follow. And I think humanism is a first class ticket to um, the very hypersexualized culture that we're seeing. Right, uh, Andrew Copson, what is, what is, <laughs> before we cast you out, <laughs> If you're all your works, <laughs> uh, what is, I'm serious, uh, what is humanism? Um, well, if you're going to go to wantonness and debauchery, I suppose you might as well travel first class. And I think, <laughs> I think that, that humanism is, in a genuine sense, more of a first class worldview than has been depicted. Humanism is the non-religious worldview that instead of looking to revelation or authority, we look to reason and evidence to understand the universe. Instead of looking to moral rules that come from outside human beings, we look to other human beings to generate values in the here and now, and also to generate meaning in our life. Instead of looking externally for some meaning to give value and sanction to the existence that we're having, a humanist view is that men and women in the course of our lives create and sustain meaning together by giving our lives purpose and a sense of fulfillment. Now I think that that is a, a very satisfying worldview, a worldview that has made a massive contribution to human uh, progress and achievement. It's a worldview that is held by a very large number of people in Britain, over a third in opinion polls, by many people. Do you think a lot of those people would not call themselves yeah, humanists? They don't know they're humanists. That's right. I think that's a very interesting point of view. I mean, uh, about 40% of people in Britain share those attitudes and beliefs and values, but no only way, about 5% of people call themselves humanists, which no. is about the same number so, as... Hold on no, a minute. So Just, I disagree. I don't... Well, I don't, I don't disagree I don't. with a... One world government, one world economy, you write about this in your book. It's taught about in, in, in the Word of God, is it not? It is, yeah. Revelation chapter 13 really is the entry point, I like to say, to this one world government, this one world economy uh, that the Bible predicts. It says that one man is going to ultimately rule the world for the last three and a half years of this, of this current age. We can see how that can happen. I mean, people today are looking for someone with answers. You know, I like to go back to uh, you know, the time in Weimar, Germany, when the hyperinflation took place, and they were looking for someone to come and to bring some, some, some order from the chaos, and that's how they ended up with Adolf Hitler. That's right. And it's the same thing in our world today. As we, I think as we see more economic chaos and nations in chaos, people are going to be looking for a savior and a deliverer. And then the ability to, uh, with exchange through the internet that you can purchase, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, the global aspect of our economy, our credit cards, online banking, yes. it all just seems to fit into the biblical narrative of, of the ancients, uh, this modern technology. It does, and the Bible never tells us this end time economy will be cashless, but I believe it has to be in, or, in order to control it, because as long as there's money, Money, you can buy on the black market and kind of get around the yeah. system. But you can't buy or sell, the Bible says, unless you have this mark of the beast, this identifying mark of the Antichrist. And to me, the only way for that to happen is it's all got to be under his control. And we see today how that could happen with all the electronic uh, technology there is, how you could control every transaction in the world. And people can't buy or sell uh, without this mark. And again, electronic currency, mm -hmm. a, a, an electronic global currency mm -hmm. is not beyond their own possibility. And we saw in the European Union the combination of all these different right. uh, uh, countries that had their own unique currency mm -hmm. uh, folding into the euro, and now that's uh, every day reported its value reported right alongside the U.S. dollar or the Japanese yen. It is. But I think one thing that's very important to me in all of this to see is when people take this mark of the beast to, to be able to buy or sell, it's going to be really taking his name upon them. So it's really going to be a mark of their allegiance to him. And I think in that coming tribulation, unlike any other time, people are going to have a clear-cut choice. Are they going to take Christ? Or are they going to follow the Antichrist? And uh, that's what's coming in this world. It's a sobering thing to think about. Is a world government would be a great government because there would be a lot less confusion. Different governments follow different religions. Different governments follow different politics. What is really cool in our neck of the woods just is not going down in, in like Yemen or something, you know? So a world, a world uh, government would work. It would, it would work. It, and, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I'm neutral about a lot of politics, but for real, a world government would make sense because there's so many governments and the reason why there's so many wars is because all these governments conflict. But if it was one government, like the United States of planet Earth or something, which is what we're pitching for, yeah, I'm for it, man, 100%. I think we're too difficult, uh, diff different to have a world government. I think we have many institutions already that have some degree of world governance in, in 
small areas like human rights organizations and I don't think so because I'm from Belgium and Belgium is such a small country and we already have like uh, four different governments and at the moment we have none because we don't we don't agree and we're such a little country so I think a world government is completely impossible <laughs> one one entity governing the entire globe no I think they're They've tried a semblance of that with the UN, and it's pretty much a debacle. No. Because I don't think it's possible in, in any... We can't even manage one simple government. How can you manage a world government? No, but I think that there should be a, a Bill of Rights for the world, for all people of the world. Yeah, why not? It could be a good idea, but at the same time, some countries, do they really have the, like, the right to have... Well, it's, I, I can't believe I'm actually saying that, because I think that everybody should have an opinion and should have the right to have this opinion, but at the same time, as the world is is right now some countries i'm not sure they should have the opportunity to actually have an influence on what happens absolutely because it's a it's a global planet i mean there's no more we all know where we all live and we all know what's going on and everyone can reach out and touch a computer and reach out and touch someone somewhere else i.e it's it's I'm, i live on planet earth I, I don't know where you're from that's and that's kind of the way it is you know it, it is what it is it's not, I don't, I don't see it as, a, I mean, as I am an American, but how do I word it? Uh, it's a global community and it's a global community for kids, especially like from the ground up. They know where everything is. It's no more America versus future found America. We all know where other countries are. We all know what's going on. You can find out what's going on at the drop of a hat. And the second that someone does something wrong or bad or something bad happens, the rest of the world knows about it and can react on it. Um, like instantly, within hours. I was never, it was never like that before. And that makes us global. So, global is global. Blessed are they which are, what? Persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, and do what? Accept you, and bless you, and congratulate you? No, they shall sell manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What should say? Rejoice, be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before them. Now, folks, I know that some churches and some Christians are persecuted for their stupidity. They're, they are persecuted because they have unfair dealings with their friends or, or in their business dealings or they, they, they are adulterers and they're, uh, uh, for example, or, or churches that are just doing foolish things and, and they're hated and they're despised for that. But I'm talking about those who have a heart for Christ. They're preaching a pure gospel and they have a heart for a lost world. The Bible says the closer you get to the mission of Christ, the closer you get to preaching the gospel that he's ordained, the more hated and the more despised you will be by the world. Why does the world hate the church and its pastors and its parishioners? What's the cause of this hatred? <clears throat> Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. The servant's not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. You see, the church and every true Christian, every true believer is hated because of our mission. I want to talk to you about the mission of the church and show you why. <clears throat> if you're truly obeying the true mission of Christ, to a lost world, you're going to be marked. You're going to be persecuted on the job. You're going to be persecuted in the church. <coughs> and, and the time will come, the closer we get to fulfilling God's mission in New York, 
When you mention Times Square Church, you're going to people see their eyebrows go up. Oh, oh, that church. Because you see, we're going to be taking a stand against the powers of darkness as we've never taken it before. And all hell's going to get angry. And everyone is walking with the enemy and a rejecter of Jesus Christ is going to be an enemy. You're going to find enemies on the job. You're going to find enemies everywhere because you're fulfilling the mission. Now, let me talk about this mission. And some of you are going to be a little horrified by what I'm saying. You're going to draw back and say, well, wait a minute, brother, that's too strong. But what is my mission as a pastor? What is your mission as, 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 as a witness for Jesus Christ? It's more than going out and just telling people Jesus loves you. It's more than trying to to give people examples of how much you suffer so they'll have pity on you so they'll listen to your gospel. Oh, oh, oh my, my, my mother just died and I'm feeling a little sad, but I want to tell you how Jesus can comfort. It's more than that. That's fine, but it goes far beyond that. Our mission is to take from ungodly men that which is dearest to their heart, their self-righteousness. You are commissioned to go and tell men who have spent a lifetime believing that they're doing good and that they're achieving something. I'm kind to my family and I'm kind to people. And they spend a lifetime building up what they believe is integrity. And you come along and tell them it's filthy rags. You, you come to translate people out of the kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. That kingdom of light that they think is nothing but bondage and suffering. You're taking away from their freedom. More than that, you, you've been sent to execute them, to kill them. How, what do you think if people come in and they hear us talk about dying to, dying to the world and dying to sin, being crucified? You say, wait a minute, what, folks, isn't that our mission? Isn't this our mission to show them that you have to die to sin and to self-will and to self-independence and you come along? And they have spent their lifetime killing their conscience, searing it, and silencing a voice. And you come along with a voice louder than their conscience. And say, without Christ, and say it as lovingly as you can. Say with tears in your eyes. But you are speaking a voice louder than their conscience. And they have spent a lifetime achieving this false peace. And you come along saying, without being born again, you're a rebel. 